So as I was mentioning, we have a very uh, distinguished speaker today. So Colonel uh, Jeff Troxell is currently serving as Research Professor of National Security and Military Strategy with the Strategic Studies Institute, United States Army War College. In addition to his research activities with the Strategic Studies Institute, for the past 14 years, he has taught an elective course on the economics of national security and has widely lectured on related topics. He also teaches an elective on United States defense policy. He earned a bachelor's degree from the United States Military Academy in 1974, a master's degree from the Woodrow Wilson School, Princeton University in 1982. He is a 1997 graduate of the United States Army War College. He served as an economics instructor with the Department of Social Studies at the United States Military Academy from 1982 to 1985. And prior to assuming his current position, he was Professor of National Security Affairs with the Center for Strategic Leadership, serving as a member of the Strategic Decision-Making Exercise Team and prior to that as the Director of National Security Studies, Department of National Security and Strategies, United States Army War College. He is also an adjunct faculty member of the Baltic Defense College. During a 30-year career with United States Army, higher level assignments included War Plans Division, Department of the Army from 1990 to 1992, as a force planner for the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and, and Requirements in the Office of the Secretary of Defense from 1994 to 1996, and Chief Engineer Plans Division, Combined Forces Command, Seoul, South Korea from 1997 to 1999. Other military assignments included command of the 3rd Engineer Battalion, 24th Infantry Division, and service with the 1st, 43rd, and 293rd Engineer Battalions. Colonel Troxell has published several book chapters to include Presidential Decision Directive 56, A Glass Half Full, in the Interagency and Counterinsurgency Warfare, Sizing the Military in the Post-Cold War Era, in the United States Post-Cold War Deference Interest, a Review of the First Decade, and Military Power and the Use of Force in the United States Army War College Guide to National Security Policy and Strategy, as well as articles in Parameters, Military Review, and with the St Strategic Study Institute. So please join me in welcoming Colonel Troxell. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm glad to be in front of this audience. This is one of my favorite groups. This is not my first time speaking before the Great Decisions. Uh, I've told folks that I've actually been engaged with uh, Great Decisions for more than 50 years. When I was in elementary school, I had a, an aunt who was very active in Great Decisions. And so at, the, at that time in the year when it was all over, I anxiously awaited the book because she gave me the book. And that perhaps sparked my interest in uh, U.S. foreign affairs and national security studies. So I really, I really think this is a great program. And, and the comment that Mike made, I think, is very apropos of what you are all about. So you study these very important topics, and then you're armed and in a position to uh, consider what's going on in our nation, what you read in the papers, and all those kind of things. And I think that's very important. So let me start with, a, a, we've got a lot of material to cover. If, if you've had a chance to read the chapter, I'll come back to that in a little bit. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there, and, that, and we're going to try to cover a lot of, uh, a lot of ground uh, this afternoon. But let me start with a disclaimer. What you're going to hear about some of these issues are my views. They're not the War College views, the Department of the Army, Department of Defense, U.S. government, all that other kind of stuff. And so you can take all these with a grain of salt. I also like to get a quick little idea about the audience, uh, just a little bit more. So, so do we have any economists in the group? We do? Is there an economist out here in the group? Did I hear? Raise a hand. All right. Well, then we're in good shape. Uh, no one can really challenge me on, on too much of this. How about, how about some uh, businessmen or businesswomen in the group? Okay, we got a couple there, so that's, that's certainly a point of view on these. Um, union members, 
past or current. Okay, that's another point of view on perhaps some of these issues. And finally, how many of you have shopped at Walmart at least once within the last six months? <laughs> All right, so we ought to have a friendly audience here. I think that's going to put me in pretty good stead that uh, that's part of what we're about here. Okay, so I, I know most of you would probably rather be down in Jamaica at this particular point in time. Maybe some of the group is already able to get to Jamaica, but I'm, but I'm hopeful that by the time these two hours are done, that for those of you that didn't get a chance to go to Jamaica, we'll say, well, you know, that two hours at AHAC, that really wasn't too bad. If I couldn't be in Jamaica, I'd just as soon have been there. <laughs> All right, so let me start. And you're going to see, I, I sprinkle in some uh, political cartoons with this presentation. And so I want to start with this one. Uh, and this goes back a ways, but, but I think what it does, it sort of captures the importance of the topic, the seriousness, and perhaps the controversy that's associated with this topic. So on, on, the, uh, on the left side, you know, you see, okay, there's the industrial strength of the United States, and that's supposedly what we once were, and then that's been replaced by the House of Cards, this temple of free trade consumerism. And so, like I said, I think that sort of captures, to a certain extent, the different sides of the argument here. And it's a very important issue. It's a very controversial issue, and actually pretty complex, too. So we'll, we'll try to, uh, to get into to some of those kind of issues. So here's my agenda. Talk a little bit about uh, trade theory, some context, US trade policy, the current debate. And then the bottom line is uh, sort of jobs in the economy. And I think, uh, you know, this, this uh, quote from one of our famous economists, Mark Twain, uh, you know, I, I think this is pretty important, and we're all about this. You know, this is an educational process here. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so that can really get you in trouble. And, and I'm, you know, we'll, we'll see how far we, we go with that. But I, I said I was going to mention this. You know, hopefully you've had a chance to read this chapter, uh, I guess chapter 8, U.S. Trade Policy. Because I think it's a very, very good piece. I think they're very balanced, and it gives you a, a great idea of the complexity of this particular topic. All right, let's get into theory. You know, if you're going to have an economic presentation, you've got to have a little economic theory. So for those of you that, you know, remember some economics in your past, you can go way back and, and, and you know, uh, dust off the cobwebs, and we'll talk about this. So why... Why trade? What's, what's, the, what's the theory behind uh, trade? So it's this whole notion, you know, we, go, we can go back to uh, Adam Smith, 1776, uh, The Wealth of Nations. So that book came out right about the same time as our Declaration of Independence. So it's, it's interesting, the coincidence there. About 40 years later, David Ricardo, another English economist, you know, came up with this notion about comparative advantage which essentially says that a nation should focus their economic activities on what they do best, based on opportunity costs and some of these other kind of things. And so uh, that follows from there, you know, the overall purpose of an economy. And this is probably as much from a US perspective. You know, benefit the consumer, maximize global wealth, we're gonna, we're gonna get efficient use of scarce resources, so this is gonna be an optimal solution but not just for a nation, but generally for everybody. Because they are going to, people, nations are going to be doing what they do best. And so that's going to represent a more efficient use of resources across the board. And that, in reality, uh, represents a mutually enriching uh, proposition. This is not a zero-sum game. This is a win-win proposition. I mean, that's, that's the theory behind this. Now, some societies, some nations, may have a little bit different view of their overall purpose. And that's for consideration. I mean, you know, you could, you could argue that some societies actually do have a greater concern about overall social cohesion, uh, the well-being of the entire populace, and, and so that, that changes that equation perhaps a little bit. So then you look at what are the benefits, the benefits from free trade. Uh, you know, you compete based on price or quality of goods. And so if you've got competition, so hopefully the prices will be lower and the quality of goods will be up. So that's, that's one of the, the basic issues there. Uh, increased consumer choice, more products that are available to you as a consumer. 
and specialization. I mean, you know, no, none of us now are the independent, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. There might be some independent farmers out here. I didn't ask that question ahead of time. But we're certainly not in a position that people that lived in this area 200 years ago or 300 years ago that did everything. We specialize. We specialize in what we're good at, whether it's teaching or research or managing or uh, being a mechanic or construction, being a homemaker. I mean, you specialize what you're good at, and so that, that's what uh, free trade really highlights, this importance of specialization. And then you can argue, you know, the spread of technology, that gets a little bit beyond just our own nation. And then finally, you know, if you're going to like something, it's got to be for world peace. You know, that's why we do things for world peace. But I'll come back to that. I mean, it's, it's not quite as, as frivolous a thought of that, a, a, a thought that, that I show there. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the upside, the basic theory. And all economists, well, most economists will say, yeah, that's true. Free trade is good for all of those reasons that I just said. But there's a downside, too. So there's a flip side of this coin a little bit in terms of the arguments against trade. So obviously, there's a concern about loss of domestic jobs. Uh, we lose jobs because you know, we're, we're buying products from someplace else. Not only that, the more you trade, perhaps the lower your wage base is because now our workers are competing with lower cost workers someplace else. I mean, that's the whole notion of competition. You know, you're competing based on quality or price, and so that's part of it. So there's a big concern there. Uh, there's also this notion of this lack of a level playing field, that our various rules and regulations in the United States, for whatever reason we've put them in place, that may generate greater cost for some of our firms, and they don't have that same level playing field. And so that's a concern. Likewise, when you, when you talk about, and we'll talk about free trade agreements, are we able to enforce those agreements? Free trade agreements uh, en encompass a set of rules, but if we can't enforce those rules, then we still may come back to that lack of a level playing field. There's a little bit, perhaps, loss of government revenue, not such a big deal anymore because we depend on, on uh, income taxes uh, primarily in this country. And then there's sort of a, a national defense. Obviously, we don't want to trade away the... The, uh, the family secrets to our competitor, to our opponents out there. We need to protect uh, national security technology and some of those kind of things. And then finally, there's the infant industry argument. And, and that essentially says that if you're, you know, free trade is good if you have established and you build up those skills, you develop that specialization. But if you haven't had a chance to do that, then you've got to give your own industries that opportunity. You've got to give them that window. And so this picture over here, this is Seattle, 1999. And this is a big embarrassment for the United States because this was the next uh, World Trade Organization meeting. And President Clinton went out there and we're going to have this big meeting of the World Trade Organization and we're going to move forward on the continued liberalization of trade. Huge protests, big battle in the streets. I mean, this really started... From there, in the next several years, this huge backlash, backlash against uh, globalization. And any place there'd be a globalization type meeting, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, all these international institutions, there'd be big, huge demonstrations. And so this, this particular meeting in 1999, it essentially fell apart. So that's, that's the downside, the arguments against trade. And one of the things to recognize, there are winners and losers. And generally, when you think about the winners, um, the winners are in a position that, that it, you have dispersed gain. So we as consumers, all of us, benefit from lower prices and, and better quality and greater choice. But that's sort of a dispersed, you know, we all benefit, you know, I saw a lot of hands of people that go to Walmart. We all benefit from lower prices in, in those kind of circumstances. But the losers are very much concentrated. The people that perhaps get put out of work because the firms close, because they can't compete. So the gain is dispersed, the pain is very much concentrated. And so that's what makes these trade issues so tough from a political perspective. So one of the things that we have to do, and one of the things that theory says, they say that the people that gain from trade, 
you know, broadly speaking society, their gains outweigh the loss of those that feel that pain. So the gain should be able to compensate those that feel the pain. Compensation. And so this is this whole notion of a, of a safety net. What do we provide for those people that are out of work because of trade, competition, competition from overseas? And we have this whole notion that was discussed in the reading about trade adjustment assistance. So we provide things for workers, firms, and farms that have been impacted by our free trade policy. And there's a whole list of issues that are provided there in terms of income support, training benefits, health coverage, relocation allowances, a lot of things that are available that we have decided as a nation are important to compensate those who are losing from trade because the vast majority of us are gaining uh, from trade. So that's, that's the downside of trade and then what we, what we do to try to compensate. Um, now, trade, when we talk about these trade agreements, it always used to be focused on uh, manufactured items, merchandise, and what we're trying to do is lower or eliminate tariffs. And that's sort of your standard how we're going to get to free trade. The agenda is much, much broader now. Now when people talk about these free trade agreements and what we're interested in, it's a very, very wide uh, agenda. Agricultural products are out there, very, very contentious. Uh, services are very important. Uh, and I'll come back to services a little bit, you know, in, oh, let's see, didn't want to do that, wanted to hit this button. Intellectual property, we are very much concerned about intellectual property rights, IPR, another one of those acronyms. Uh, and we want to protect our technology, our trade secrets. Firms want to protect their proprietary information. Now the flip side of this intellectual property, that's our concern from a developed nation. You know, a flip side of that is, you know, this sort of represents people demonstrating for access to generic drugs. Because one of the things we try to protect are the patents on drugs. And that makes these very important drugs in third world nations much, much more expensive. So their argument is, no, you gotta, you know, you gotta uh, relax the patents so we can be much healthier down here in these nations. So that's a part of the intellectual property, government procurement rules, uh, fair labor standards. You know, sometimes uh, the argument is that there's this whole notion of social dumping. That because of trade, what we're doing from a social perspective is we're sending these jobs overseas. They don't have labor unions. They don't have labor rights. They're working under poor conditions, and that's social dumping. This is a picture of the garment factory in Bangladesh, if you remember when that collapsed. So that's one of those issues out there in terms of the, you know, how you level playing field, how you, how you try to level that out, human rights concerns, and then environmental protection. Uh, you know, this is a, uh, a picture of pollution in, in China. Uh, so this is another one of those, those issues where the, we have regulations that impose certain res restraints on our manufacturing firms in terms of what they can do uh, about polluting the environment, or what they can't do to avoid polluting the environment. Other countries may not, and therefore, it's not a level playing field. So those are some of the issues there. And then from a, from a geopolitical perspective, there's a whole other side of this argument that says, well, you talk about free trade, but what we're really after is fair trade. So these are developing nations in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America. And their argument is, I mean, it's really encompassed by this book here, Bad Samaritans, the myth of free trade and the secret history of capitalism. Their argument is, you know, when you were a new nation, the United States, you didn't practice free trade. You had infant industries. You had controls on all these kind of things. And you were in a position to grow and develop those skills and capabilities that you now have. So we need the same growth period. Don't come at us and say, oh, free trade is going to be good for everybody. You need to cut us the same kind of slack that you enjoyed when you were in that development stage. So that's just part of the issue here in terms of this whole notion about uh, how things should be different when we think of it from a geopolitical perspective. That we shouldn't impose this notion of free trade across the globe for nations that are, that are just still growing in that development uh, stage. So that's, that's sort of the broad brush theory about trade, upside, downside, uh, domestic, and uh, international. Now, now let, me, 
lay, uh, present a couple issues about context because I think context is very important where we are today. So it's this whole notion, uh, you know, free trade and trade liberalization really took off at the end of World War II. So part of the concern was, you know, we're coming out of the Great Depression, the 1930s. And nations, what they tried to do, one of the things that they tried to do in the 1930s was, okay, we're in a, we're in a depression. Uh, we're going to put tariffs. We're going to try to protect our local production. So that's what they did. Beggar thy neighbor policies, the, the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act, competitive currency devaluations. We're going to devalue the dollar, make our goods cheaper on the world market. And what that generated, this is an economist, Kindleberger, and he called it the Kindleberger Spiral. And because we did it, the UK did it, France did it, Germany did it, all these nations started piling on on these tariffs and currency devaluations, and they just took trade from this level just essentially down the toilet, down the spiral, the implosion of world trade. And then part of the argument was because of the severity of the Great Depression, because of government national policies that even made it worse from an international perspective, made it much worse from an international uh, competitive perspective, that was one of the underlying causes of World War II. So we're coming out of World War II, we're about winning, ready to win the war, and everybody says, because of all that argument, we don't want to go there again. We want to fix it. So we want to get a handle on this international economic regime, and we want things to be better as we go into the peace following World War II. So the uh, Allied powers got together at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. That's why they call it the Bretton Woods system. And they came up with these uh, three broad goals. One is we have to stabilize currencies, and they created the International Monetary Fund. We're not going to talk about that today. Uh, two, they wanted to assist in economic recovery, and they created the International Bank of Reconstruction and Development, which became the World Bank. We're not really going to talk about that today. And then the third thing is, okay, in addition to currencies, and in, in addition to development assistance, we also want to get a handle on trade. They want to promote free trade. And they talked about the International Trade Organization. Anybody know anything about the International Trade Organization? That's good, because it never really sort of played out. The United States essentially vetoed the idea. So, you know, this, this give and take on free trade, you know, it's not a new thing. I mean, you know, there have been political issues here about this whole notion for a long, long time. The United States Congress said, no, 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 we don't want an international trade organization because that's going to require us to give up sovereignty. We're not too excited about that. So instead of an ITO, they came up with the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. That eventually, over the next 50 years, in 1995, as I show up there, that eventually evolved into the World Trade Organization. So we eventually got around to the ITO, and now we call it the, the World Trade Organization. So uh, this is uh, John Maynard Keynes, very prominent economist. He was the leader of the UK delegation, and Harry Dexter White, a uh, key figure in the Treasury Department, actually ran the IMF, World Bank, for a while. Actually, also happened to be a Soviet spy, but that's another story, too. But at any rate, so that's, that's part of these international regimes. We created them, we being primarily the United States, but the winners at, at the end of World War II. So this is an international system that we created, and those are sort of the components of it, you know, based on the gold standard and all that kind of stuff. You don't need to focus on that too much because it's all changed. 30 years after that, we've got this in what I call up here the financial revolution. And this is important to recognize because this is a very, very important context. So, President Nixon went off the gold standard in the 1970s for various reasons. Uh, I mean, he just did it. You know, he just unilaterally said, forget it, we're not going to back any of uh, our currency by gold anymore. You know, wasn't one of these, let's have a big conference, you know, discussion. He just did it. And that created a lot of changes in the, mon <clears throat> in the monetary system. But one of the big things that happened in the financial system we liberalized capital markets. So now capital, investment, could flow all over the world. It used to be pretty much constrained to your own national boundaries. People didn't have emerging market mutual funds. Now they do, but they didn't back then prior to the, to the 70s. So that made a huge difference in this financial market. 
And then that helped lead to globalization. And, so, and these are just some of the key issues that are related to the current situation with trade. This is part of the context. So transportation costs are way down, so trade becomes a much more viable proposition. The information technology revolution, we can communicate all over the world instantaneously. Telework, all that kind of stuff. So you can collaborate. You know, you just, it's not that you have to be next door to somebody or you have to be within a taxi ride or something like that to work with a business partner. Now you can just get on your iPhone, your computer. You can collaborate across the world. Uh, relax capital markets. You know, now capital can go to wherever it needs to go to help specialize where those comparative advantages are. Then you put that all together, and then there's a big movement for free trade agreements. That facilitates these other three aspects here. And then what started to happen, and I'll come back to these last two little bullets here, disaggregated manufacturing and global supply chains. How we make things today is much different. Much, much different. And all of that is part of the context about trade. And, and how this issue of trade is, is so important to us. Okay, so how did it turn out? As I said, you know, this is, a, this is a really pretty good book here by Robert Kagan. You know, he's talking, uh, you know, just came out a couple years ago. The World America Made. We made it, you know, back, going back to Bretton Woods. This international system that we are operating in is really the world we made. And from a trade perspective... You know, GDP, global GDP has gone up. Trade has just skyrocketed. Uh, and you can look, you know, 1990 here is where it really starts to take off trade. What happened in 1990? The Soviet Union went away. So the Soviet Union goes away. The Cold War goes away. The communist system and the free world system are now just one system. And so now we've opened up the world to all of these new consumers, all these new business people. So trade takes off. By the way, um, this is Thomas Friedman's written a lot of books out there. You probably have heard of The World is Flat, a very good book. I think this is his best one on economics, uh, published 1999, The Lexus and the Olive Tree, because it really talks about this international system that's been created, finance, trade, uh, information, globalization. It's really very, very good. So I'd, I'd recommend that to you. And then the, the other thing that, to recognize about this Trade is not necessarily just about economics. Now, I talked, you know, principally early on, the trade theory was primarily economics. But there are also political and strategic reasons for what we do sometimes in trade policy. And you've got to remember that. Strategic sometimes is very important. And so the argument would be that, you know, this is like world peace. It gives us world peace, which is who's against world peace? But it brings stability and prosperity. So that's very important. And so that, that's part of the argument. And from a global perspective, you could probably say, OK, I got it. Really not too bad. All right, so that's context, the context of how, how we set and how we think about trade policy. Now let's talk about US trade policy in a little bit more detail. You know, incoming. We talk free trade. We are a free trade nation. Eh. Depends who you talk to. You know, we just passed a, uh, what is it, a, a $1 trillion farm bill. The Senate, the pre I guess the president is today. Maybe it's today or yesterday. He was in Michigan signing the bill. So, you know, this is part of it. We got subsidies, you know. And so we talk free trade, but some people would say, well, you know, we're really managed trade. In some areas, we're free. In some areas, we're not so free. There's some other things we do. OK, let's look at this policy. Maybe this was one of the reasons why it is the way it is. Um, we have a, this thing called the Constitution. You know, it always seems to get in the way when we're trying to do business. <laughs> you know, this, these little documents, you know, it's... So, you know, it's like, well, the president's the president. Why can't he just figure out what he wants to do? You know, the Constitution gets in the way. So this says, Article 2, Section 2, the president shall have the power to consent by with the consent of Senate to make treaties, a free trade agreement, a treaty. However, Article 1, Section 8 says, Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations. That's pretty explicit. You know, maybe the founders knew what they were talking about. Uh, and it's, it's a very, very political process. And I think we all know that. 
And, and we can talk about some of those issues, uh, hopefully particularly in the, in the Q&A. Even within the executive branch, everybody is involved. I mean, I, I don't have, you know, I, I should have put uh, Department of Labor clearly involved, uh, Health and, uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Everybody is involved from the executive branch, lots of congressional players, and then all of these interest groups. Oh, he doesn't have batteries, so I guess I got to use this. These must be foreign-made batteries, I'm sure. <laughs> not certainly not American-made. But anyway, so the economist was making this comment about the farm bill, and it says, "You know, uh, we we've been complaining in the United States so long about how Congress can't get anything done, and we forgot how ugly it is when they do get something done." And, and so that, that was this, you know, because evidently this farm bill, you know, it's got all kinds of stuff in it. But at any rate, it's a very, very political process, and we just have to recognize that. Uh, you know, so much for economic theory. You know, it really is politics to a certain extent. Okay, uh, there are lots of tools for, that are involved in our economic policy and trade policy. And I know most of the article talked about sort of the upside of trade and how we try to push forward trade. But, you know, we need to recognize that there are a lot of things that we can do to restrict trade. And one of those down there at the bottom are sanctions, and I'll come back to that in a little bit, because that's a very important foreign policy tool, sanctions. And then there's these things that we can do to promote trade. We'll talk uh, more about free trade agreements. I already touched on TAA, trade adjustment assistance, and also this trade promotion authority. We'll come back to that as well. All right, trade sanctions, just real quick on this. Uh, those are the nations that we currently have trade sanctions on. Y you know, I say nations are, <clears throat> excuse me, our sanctions policy is a little bit different now because you see, you know, Iraq. W w wait a minute. You know, we just fought to free Iraq and we have trade sanctions. A lot of our trade sanctions now are not opposed against a nation. They are opposed against individuals. And so there are still some existing sanctions. We call these targeted sanctions. That there are, if there are particular people in regimes that are still on the run or for whatever reason that uh, we want to uh, maintain those sanctions, we certainly do that. And, and a prime example of a success of sanctions is Iran. You know, we're, we're right now deep into these negotiations with Iran about their nuclear program. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and I think you can recognize that we probably wouldn't be where we are in those negotiations if it were not for the severe sanctions that have been imposed against Iran. So that's just something to keep in the back of your, uh, back of your mind in terms of the importance of trade policies from, from the downside. All right, now, back to U.S. trade policy. Like I said, this is very strategic. So this is our national, national uh, uh, security strategy, 2010. The new one should be out probably in another month or so, uh, probably not going to be a whole lot different. And you can see what President Obama said about our national security. So up at the top, we got to renew American leadership, and we do that first by building at home and then shaping abroad. So there's a lot of this discussion about nation building at home. And so that's some of the, if, if you had a chance to listen to the uh, um, State of the Union address uh, several weeks ago, we're still on this building at home uh, importance of that. But, you know, in red, it's in red because it's important. Our prosperity is inextricably linked to global prosperity. So if our economy is going to prosper, we need the globe to prosper. Why is that? Because we are so integrated in terms of selling them stuff, buying stuff, resources, all of that kind of stuff. It's a globalized economy. And so then he talks about some specifics we're going to build at home. We're all pretty familiar with that, the, importance of, the important things that we need to do to renew our economy. And, you know, this has all been talked about, education, energy, 
uh, health care, reduce the deficit. Uh, and then he's got some things out there about shaping abroad. And he talks about what's important for us to shape abroad. So one of these things down here, the third tick down there, pursue bilateral and multilateral trade agreements. So trade is strategic. It's important. And this was uh, not quite four years ago, but it's been part of our, our national policy for quite a while. Also, at the State of the Union address in uh, 2010, the president announced this national export initiative. And I know when he first announced this, people thought, man, I don't know, that's really a stretch to, if you think it's going to happen. But he said, we're going to double the amount of exports in five years. And you know, those are all the things that he talked about there on, on the right side of this chart about what we're going to do to do that. And you see the graph down below there that we're making a lot of progress. We're up to $2.2 trillion a year in exports. Now, one of the things that's a big change here, the US economy is huge. It's the largest economy in the world, $17 trillion, just about $17 trillion. And so our manufacturers have relied on you and me to buy their products, the domestic market, because we had a huge domestic market. And so a lot of these, and that's why one of the things why the first subtick up there, exports by small and medium-sized enterprises. They weren't interested in exporting because they didn't have to. And now the notion is, no, we've got good products at this level. We need to be out there in the international market. And so that's what a lot of this push is. And so we're making very good progress. Whether or not we'll double it in another uh, couple years, it's hard to say. But we've made a lot of progress. And then this line across the top says the number of jobs that are associated with that. As we export more, we have to hire people to make those products, so we employ more people. So that's this notion. That's part of our, that's part of our current trade policy is the National Export Initiative. All right, now let's get on to these uh, free trade agreements, some of these agreements here. A trade liberalization, there's lots of ways you can do it. You can do it globally. That's the WTO, and we'll talk about that just a little bit. You can do it regional agreements. Uh, we'll talk about several new initiatives. Uh, the 20th anniversary in, in January of this year of, N of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, US, Canada, Mexico. And then you can do it bilateral. One of the most recent bilateral agreements is US and South Korea. And we'll talk about uh, those in, in a, just a little bit of detail. OK, World Trade Organization, 159 members. Down here in the lower right, you see the map. Russia is one of the first, or is one of the most recent adherents to the WTO. Uh, the people in yellow, nations in yellow, are observers. And so they're working on WTO. And the uh, nations in red, nobody really cares about them. So. No, you know, I, I, you know they, they've got some problems, so we'll, we'll see. But at any rate, so 159 members. Uh, one of the things that's really important about the WTO, it does have a dispute settlement mechanism. You know, I talked earlier about the level playing field. How do you enforce rules? This is a rules-based organization. This is part of this world that America made. We want a rules-based international system. So they have a dispute settlement mechanism. If we don't like something that China's doing, or China doesn't like something we're doing, or Brazil doesn't like what we're doing, they can go to the WTO, build their case, pay lawyers lots of money, and the WTO will say, yep, you're right. China, you're wrong. You have to compensate the United States. So you two guys either negotiate and work it out, or you have to compensate. Or Brazil, you're right. US, you have to do something. So that's the dispute settlement mechanism. And, and that's been really pretty effective. So that's very important. Uh, and then the basic standards, liberalization, non-discrimination, reciprocity that, that we've seen with the GATT. Uh, the World Trade Organization has been working on, I, I showed that little picture there about Seattle, 1999, when the negotiation collapsed. Uh, in November 2001, so in November 2001, just a couple months after 9-11, and this was really at the initiative of the United States, we started the Doha round. It's the Doha Development Agenda. The theory being, you know, terrorism is bad, and we've seen how bad it can be at 9-11. 
we need to get our act together and energize this trade liberalization thing. We got to get back on track here because if we get more trade, remember that little cloud, stability and prosperity? We're going to bring that to the world as a whole. We're going to put a damper on some of this terrorism. Very, very strategic argument to do that. Well, it's been very, very difficult. You see some of the, the goals, objectives of Doha, a very comprehensive, if we could get it, you know, a lot of money for the global economy. There have been lots of rounds, Cancun, Hong Kong, Geneva. Everybody thought that the Doha round was dead until uh, just a couple months ago. And they got the, in Bali, of all places, they got the Bali package. December 7th, uh, 2013. And so this is the very first WTO. Now, when you do something in the WTO, you got to have everybody agree to it. Everybody. 159 nations got to say, yep, I vote for it. Otherwise, it doesn't go anywhere. So we got 159 nations that said, okay, well, which tells you why it's taken us from 2001 to 2013 to get anything. And what they actually came up with in 2013 was really sort of the lowest common denominator. Uh, some basic issues to facilitate trade. All the tough stuff, agricultural, services, all of that was sort of taken off the agenda because it was just too hard. And so the argument is, okay, we're going we're gonna to eat this elephant one bite at a time. And so that's, that's where we are right now in the World Trade Organization. All right, now let's talk a little bit about NAFTA. Uh, NAFTA, as I said, uh, 20 years, 20 year anniversary for NAFTA. This was a big deal. This was the first free trade agreement between developed rich countries, i.e. the United States and Canada, and a developing nation, Mexico. And so, is that going to work? Uh, you, you know, it's one thing to have trade with, you know, nations that are at the general same socioeconomic level. What happens when you bring in a nation that's much, much lower? And that's one of the reasons why NAFTA was such a big deal. That's one of the reasons why, you know, the election in 1992, Ross Perot and the giant sucking sound that would suck jobs from the United States down into Mexico. So you see some of the issues there. It created a huge market, which is a good deal. Um, a big trade increase on the chart in the lower, lower right. Uh, the net gain or loss, there's a big question about that. You know, some economists will say, well, you know, we lost jobs. Some will say we gained jobs. I mean, this is one quote that says, in reality, NAFTA did not cause the huge job losses feared by the critics, nor did it create the large economic gains predicted by the supporters. The net overall effect of NAFTA on the U.S. economy appears to have been relatively modest. So it was a big deal caused a lot of uproar and maybe for not a whole lot of reasons. But one of the things that's real important here, one of the things that it did do for North America, it, was, it helped to integrate this supply chain. And I'll, I'll come back to this a little bit, this new uh, form of manufacturing. Uh, so that's a big deal. There, there's a debate on this last thing here. Did it help in any sense create some political stability for Mexico? Some say yes. Some say no. So uh, we can talk about that. I don't want to spend any time on that one. There's this discussion now about we want to deepen NAFTA. In fact, the, the three uh, leaders are going to get together in February uh, to talk about the perhaps you know, expanding NAFTA. You know, one of the things that happened to NAFTA went into effect, and then 2001 didn't help NAFTA any. Because what happened in the United States? We tightened the borders. We got much, much more concerned about our borders. And so if you're really going to have this kind of free trade, you're going to have this integrated supply chain, it's tough when you have so much concern about the borders. So that's one of the things that they're, they're going to take a look at. All right, free trade agreements. In general, these are, uh, with the exception of NAFTA, which shows up there, Canada and Mexico, we don't have that many free trade agreements. You know, that's the navy blue uh, nations up there. They're not that many out there. There's an argument that the ones that we do have are strategic, some in the Middle East, obviously South Korea. Uh, but that's our bilateral free trade agreements. They come in bunches. And this gives you an idea of, of when they were enacted. Uh, a lot of activity during the Bush administration with some free trade agreements. Panama, Colombia, South Korea, 2011. 
they were all negotiated in the Bush administration and finally signed and enacted uh, just recently. And now we've got these two new regional uh, agreements that I'm going to talk about. I think that's the next slide. We're going to get into that. Yeah. Oh, no, China. Okay. So let's talk about the debate, the current debate. So the current debate says China. You know, China's eating our lunch, and it's because of their trade policy. And so we're going to talk about that. You know, that's, this is China. You see the cartoon there. You know, we try to stimulate our economy with fiscal spending, fiscal stimulus, and that's supposed to generate jobs in America, but, you know, really it generates jobs in China. That's what the cartoon's trying to say. And our big problem is we think China cheats. So this is taken from a local newspaper in 2008, Pennsylvania. See, China cheats, Pennsylvania loses. Uh, the last big primary in 2008 between now President Obama and, and uh, Hillary Clinton was the last big competitive primary was in Pennsylvania. So they were all after each other about trade was a huge issue in the 2008 uh, Democratic primary. And so that's when this came up. China cheats. So that's what we're worried about. So this is the fear. You know, China joins the WTO uh, back here in 2000, and it takes off. This little blue line here is their, their exports. That's the big issue, this huge surge. And so China becomes the world's workshop. They become the world's workshop, and what happens to our trade deficit? It goes up and up and up. And we're not very happy about that. So that's the concern that we have with China. But when you look at it a little bit, peel the onion back a little bit more, and you know the argument over here in the lower left says that we don't have a trade deficit issue with China. We have a trade deficit issue with the Pacific Rim. We, for years, for decades, we've been importing more and more stuff from the Pacific Rim nations. And so what has happened over the last couple decades, you see this chart here, you know, actually, 2011, just slightly less than what we were importing in 1990 from the Pacific Rim, but the amount that comes from China, this light blue column, is much, much greater. So Chinese imports have displaced Japanese, Philippine, uh, Korean, perhaps. So that's one of the issues. So it's really not all that uh, it's chalked up to be from this upper chart here. And then the other thing to note about China, over on the right-hand side here, a lot of what we export, import from China is made by foreign invested enterprises, U.S. multinationals, European, Japanese multinationals. Huge investment in China, and so in reality, a lot of that, a lot of those profits are actually coming back to the United States. By the way, that's a much different picture than it is with Japan because we still import a lot from Japan. Most of that is owned by Japanese firms. So we've got this thing called the smiley curve. I first ran into this in an article in Atlantic Monthly by James Fallows, and he said this is part of this new manufacturing process. Where's the value added in the manufacturing? It's on the upper ends of the smile. It's in the design, it's in the branding, and it's in the sales and the service contracts. Okay, where is the United States on the smiley curve? The United States is on the upper ends of the smile. That's what we do. That's good. Where is China? China's down here in the trough. Manufacturing and assembly. So this argument would, would say that it's not such a bad thing as long as we can keep our hands on the, the high value added aspects of, of the manufacturing process that's a good thing for the United States. Now, you know, we got to recognize that, you know, this is not a top secret document, the smiley curve. So the Chinese know about the smiley curve, and the Chinese say, hey, wait a minute, we want to move up on the upper ends of the smile, too. So this is a very, very competitive relationship. You know, we just can't take anything for granted. And so then you look at things like um, the iPad. And you talk about where's the value in the iPad, you know, and I don't know what an iPad costed. I don't have one. I'm, I'm still Amish when it comes to some of these high-tech things, so I don't, I don't have any i stuff. I don't have an iPad, an iPhone, iTunes, any of that stuff. But at any rate, so if it costs a couple hundred dollars, maybe $300 for an iPad, how much of that money goes to China? And these Apple products are pretty well known for this analysis. 
you know, Chinese labor, maybe 2%. So most of that, it's the upper ends of the smiley curve. So that's just one of the things to take into consideration. Then what that, that, what that means is, when we look at those trade deficit numbers from China, what's happening is China is just the place where everything comes to get put together in a final product. So all these bits and pieces come into China, they put it together as an iPad, and they send it to the United States, and you add up all those iPads that we buy, and that's a negative on our trade deficit, and it's all associated with China. But in reality, the actual number, you know, this says probably 25% less. Uh, I think, I think the, uh, the Great Decisions book actually said 40%. So we don't know. This is part of this new manufacturing processes out there, global supply chains, disaggregated manufacturing. The, the rules that are in place to account for that just haven't caught up. And then the final thing, this is another one back to this strategic notion. This is Tom Friedman. Uh, the importance of this integrated uh, economy that we live in. He used to have uh, the McDonald's theory of conflict prevention. I don't know if you remember that. The McDonald's theory of conflict prevention said uh, any two nations that have McDonald's in them will not go to war with one another. And the, and the argument was, not so much that they all like the burgers, the argument was that that represents, McDonald's represents a middle class society. And middle class societies are not interested in nationalism. They're not interested in wars. They're just interested in their standard of living, prosperity. So they're not, they won't go to war. Well, it so happened that Belgrade had a McDonald's. And when we bombed Serbia, you know, so he had to come up with another theory. So his theory, and uh, his new theory is the Dell theory of conflict prevention. And this, you know, he's looking at a Dell computer, his laptop, and he says, you know, all these bits and pieces come from all over the world. And the theory is that no two nations that are engaged in this integrated supply chain can afford to go to war with one another because it's going to ruin their own economy because they are dependent for components on these other people. There was a recent article in Foreign Affairs from last summer that was called um, Mutual Assured Production. And it talked about China and Japan. Uh, you know, this, this, we'll see how it plays out. But the argument was that there are so many Chinese firms in, 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 uh, or Japanese firms in China, they're dependent on each other's components. And so that's really going to dampen down conflict. So that's one of the things about manufacturing. When we look at China now, that used to be the workshop of the world. Now it's sort of the consumers of the world. This is the new way to look at China, that this is where the new market is. I talked about this huge domestic market in the United States. It's still there. It's still very, very important. But China, consumers in China are going to be huge. We're after that $10 trillion prize, and lo and behold, the trade surplus that China has and the trade deficit that the United States has has decreased significantly. So we think that's going to continue to play out. Okay, next issue is the currency. We're very concerned about China as a currency manipulator, and there's lots of things that we can talk about that. This is the most recent Treasury report from October 2013. Uh, this has to come out every six months. It's a very good report, by the way, uh, on, in terms of an overview of the U.S. economy and the global economy. So um, Secretary Liu says that we've done the numbers, and really the Chinese currency is not that significantly overvalued. They're making progress, so it's not as big a deal as what we thought it was. And oh, by the way, when you talk about currencies, you know, we're not lily white on this thing either. We got this thing going on down here, you know, the rich world, quantitative easing. Uh, and that creates, a, you know, quantitative easing, really, it just means we're printing dollars to buy bonds so that we can keep our long-term interest rates down. And the rest of the world hates it. There are big currency concerns out there in, in emerging markets. So when you talk about manipulating currencies, it's a very complex issue, uh, lots, of, lots of things to consider. All right, these new trade agreements, the 21st century trade agreements. This is the Trans-Pacific Partnership the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. These are known as comprehensive and high standard. They're going to do all those things that are on that chart. So they're going to go way beyond cutting tariff rates, tariff rates between the US 
in Europe are very low anyway. But they're going to go way beyond cutting tariff rates. They're going to go way beyond just focusing on, on manufactured goods. They're going to cover all these other things. And that's one of the big deals about these two trans-oceanic uh, trade agreements that are being negotiated. They will set new rules and new standards, and that's very important in terms of future trade agreements. So that's what we're after here. There's the Trans-Pacific Partnership, 12 nations, 11 other than the United States there in the forest green. The light green are countries that are thinking about joining. China and uh, India are perhaps uh, in the future might come on board as well. 40% of the global GDP involved in a Trans-Pacific Partnership. But you know one of the reasons why we're doing this right now? Okay, it's economic. 40% of GDP is a pretty good deal. But it's also strategic. You know, what did we announce a couple years ago, right? The pivot, the rebalance to Asia, and we're all focused on, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to move 60% of our naval assets to the Pacific now instead of 50-50 or whatever. Okay, there is a military shift to support this rebalance, but there's also an economic plank to that too. So this is strategic in terms of strengthening the, U the U.S. position in the Pacific. And it's very important because at the same time we're negotiating this, China's got what they call the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership is being negotiated at the same time. That's between the ASEAN nations, all the, the nations from Southeast Asia, plus six, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, Korea, India, and China. So there's competing negotiations going out there. So the TPP is probably a pretty good deal if we can make it happen. But not to be outdone, and you can look at these charts and you can figure out that we've got a very, very strong economic relationship with Europe, and the Europeans are feeling pretty down right now because we are pivoting to Asia, and they think, well, hey, what about us? You know, how, you remember us over here? Okay, so we're going to do the TTIP. Another good deal. This is about 50% of the global GDP. And you can see that the connection here, one of the things that's important about these pie charts, most of the foreign direct investment, you know, we talk about manufacturing going to poor countries, offshoring uh, jobs, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. Most of the foreign direct investment, both out and in, is really sort of north-north. It's between the U.S. and Europe, U.S., Canada, U.S., Europe, and Japan. You know, there's a little bit that goes to some of these other nations out here, but not that much. And so that's just something to keep in mind. So if we can make this deal happen, it's going to be a good deal. You know, this just shows you some numbers for the U.S., EU, and Germany. It would be a big deal. Oh, by the way, Canada recently signed a free trade agreement with the EU. Mexico is negotiating a free trade agreement with the EU. So let's roll NAFTA into this thing, too and we can all come on board. Probably a good deal. Uh, you know, Europeans are a little concerned about it, so you know, that's some of the politics that comes into play. And is it gonna happen? Uh, I don't know. One of the things we need, we need to figure out is this trade promotion authority. You read about that in the Great Decisions. And so that's the authority that the president has. It says that if the president, actually his special trade represent, representative, ne negotiates this bill, now, it's not just tariffs, so it's all these other things involved. So there has to be an implementing bill. It's not just that we can say, okay, there's a new treaty, you know, up or down. There's an implementation bill, much, much more complicated. Well, if Congress gets a hold of that, you can guess what would happen. You know, there'd be all kinds of amendments. So this Trade Promotion Authority says no. You will, Congress, will expeditiously vote up or down the agreement impl and impl the implementation bill along with it. So this is what we've got now. The last time uh, TPA was voted on was in uh, 2002. It won in the House by a, an outstanding majority, 215 votes to 212. This is a tough deal. Uh, the president, now actually we, we finally got a bill, a proposal from Senator Baucus who was just named the, uh, new, uh, the new U.S. ambassador to China, uh, on January 10th, a bipartisan bill is presented. The president on January 28th says, okay, we need to get this bipartisan trade promotion. And two days later, Senator Reid says, it's not going to happen. Not on my watch. We'll see. 
it's going to be very, very tough political argument on trade promotion. All right, let me, let me wrap up here with a couple things I'm going to fly through uh, in terms of, you know, sort of, you know, I started with some context, and now we'll come back to some, a different type of context that I think it's important to consider trade. So, you know, this is the, this is the corporate America that says, you know, free trade at last, free trade at last, thank God almighty, free trade at last. And you got the poor American workers down here, and you got the global workers over here. So that's one of the issues that we need to think about. One of those the United States is concerned about is outsourcing and offshoring. This is from a fairly recent economist report. It says, you know, it's not quite as bad as it used to be. Uh, things are a little bit better in the United States uh, because for some of these reasons, people now have decided it's more important to be close to customers, energy costs, I'll come back to this. And we've got a pretty competitive workforce in the United States. So the bottom line down here says that, you know, a lot of people, a lot more companies are thinking about moving back to the United States. So it's still out there. Now, you know, if you look at the front end of this, 23% are still considering offshoring, but the picture is much, much more positive than it used to be because of some of those reasons that are noted there. Now, let me talk a little bit about U.S. manufacturing. There's this myth out there that we don't make anything in America anymore. Uh, and, you know, when I go clothing shopping with my wife, I'd look, you know, she's trying on stuff, and I'm just going around looking at all the tags where it's made. And that would sort of uh, validate that claim that we don't make anything in America anymore, particularly from apparel. But in reality, you look at this chart here, and the United States just very recently was overtaken by China as the number one manufacturing nation in the world. But we're neck and neck. So we still make a lot of stuff in the United States. Then you look at this chart over here on the upper right, and you see our industrial output has gone up and up and up over the last several decades. But employment has gone down and down and down. So actually, when you, when you combine the two charts, we are making about the same amount of stuff that they're making in China, but we are doing it with 10% of the workforce. Why? Because we have such productive laborers, we've got high technology, we've got automation. So that's a good news story. Productivity, output per hour in the U.S. manufacturing sector has gone up 189% in the last couple decades. That's a good news story unless you want to work in a manufacturing facility because they just don't really need that many workers anymore. The other notion here that's important, this is this chart down here that says the end of cheap China. Wages in China are going up. This projects that by 2015, Chinese labor costs are going to be essentially equal to U.S. labor cost. Now, there's another, you know, this, uh, another version of this chart says this is the shopper's nightmare. So much for all those cheap products that we like to buy. So things are getting better. And then finally, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussion about there as U.S. manufacturing renaissance. Uh, the Boston Consulting Group, that's what BCG is, says there's this industrial revival in the United States. They talk about the reasons why that's going to happen. The guy who invented the term emerging markets, he says that the next big emerging market is the United States. So things are looking up for the United States. When you look at these uh, modern new manufacturing processes, this third industrial revolution, it has a huge advantage for the United States. This chart so says that for solar panels right now, China can produce at a cheaper cost. When we add in these new additive manufacturing processes, advanced manufacturing, the United States becomes tremendously more competitive. That's the good news. The bad news is, you know, a lot of those new manufacturing processes don't require as many workers as we used to have because there's all this automation out there. We are moving to a post-industrial economy. There's an article in uh, this week's Business Week that says, factory jobs are gone. Get over it. Well, you know, we, we, we still make a lot of stuff in the United States, but that's one of the issues. So our service sector, we are a post-industrial economy. Services are skyrocketing. You know, part of that is, you know, if you look around, we've got a lot of baby boomers in this crowd here. And one of the arguments is, baby boomers have already got a lot of stuff. 
You know, I've got a lot of stuff. So what baby boomers are interested in is not more stuff. They're interested in more services. They want to go out to eat more. They want to travel. They want to do those kind of things. So we are a post-industrial society, service sector. And, you know, internationally, we're pretty good at services. So that's a good thing. OK, uh, I'm not going to spend much time on this issue here. This is the big debate going on now about our economy, I think. Inequality. You heard it in the State of the Union. You're going to hear all about it during the 2014 midterm election. Uh, this, you know, capitalism and inequality. How do we deal with it? Big, big issue. Very, very tough issue. And maybe we'll come back to that in uh, Q&A. You know, once again, uh, from a fairly recent Economist piece, special report, things aren't so bad in America. You know, cheer up. And those are the reasons why energy is a huge issue here. You know, this is a book, Comeback, that talks about this energy boost. It's a huge issue because, number one, we don't have to import as much energy as we used to. In fact, we're probably going to become a net exporter of energy project, products. Number two, energy that's needed for the manufacturing process is much, much cheaper in the United States. Gives us a huge competitive advantage. We are about 40% cheaper energy-wise in the US than, than Europe. So that's a huge advantage to us. Lots of jobs in the ener energy, energy industry. And it's all brand new. I mean, this energy boom sort of came out of nowhere. It wasn't that long ago that we were talking about peak oil. Now we're pretty happy. The scorecard, you know, we're doing better. Uh, capitalism rocks. Without it, how would we ever have the time and leisure we need to organize protest against it? <laughs> All right, I've gone a little bit longer than I wanted, but I'm going to turn this over to Mike. Thank you. I think I need to shake my head a little bit to put all the acronyms in some order. <laughs> you know. Okay, it's uh, time for me to take the annual uh, count of those, not annual, the weekly count of those who uh, are affiliated with the Army War College. If you could please raise your hand. Uh, all right, and the Navy Depot. Okay, got it. All right. Um, since it is 2.11, we're just going to take a very short break, three or four minutes, so you all can, well, we want to have